Good morning, and welcome to Mission of Grace Church. I'm Pastor David, we welcome you in the name of God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us focus on worshiping the Lord together. From Psalm 95, O come, let us sing joy to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we've come this morning for the single purpose of worshiping You. And we pray, Lord, that You would help us do that in a way that is pleasing to You. May we worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. May you bless each one of us, Lord, as we seek to please you. We pray, Lord, that you would edify us and teach us, and Lord, build us up in the most holy faith that we would walk faithfully with you. May everything that is done this morning glorify you. This we pray in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. To God be the glory, great things He had done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son Who yielded his life atonement for sin And opened the life gate that all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Father, through Jesus, his Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, promise of God. soul 
offerings to you. We pray, Lord, that you would use them and multiply them for your glory. May the gospel be continued to be proclaimed here in Gardner and Greater Gardner, and indeed to the very ends of the earth. We, Lord, desire to glorify you this day and to make your name lifted up. And so help each one of us, Lord, part of this gospel ministry. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, and thank you, Lord, for calling us to yourself, and thank you, Lord, for calling us together. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Now it's time just to make mention of remembering for tithes and offerings. The needs of this church continue during this remote ministry, and there's a couple of ways that you can remember to give either by visiting our website, missionofgracechurch.org, or mailing directly to 358 Pleasant Street, Gardner, Massachusetts. Praise God from blessing
As we go to the word this morning, let us pray for the illumination of the Holy Spirit so that we understand the word that is about to be expounded. Our Lord and our God, we know that your word is truth. Sanctify us by your word, Lord. And we pray, Father, that this word to us this morning would speak to our hearts and that we would be transformed in our belief and living out the word here set forth. May you anoint these lips of clay to preach and may you anoint the ears to hear that you would be glorified and we would be edified. This we ask in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 1 John 4, we'll be reading verses 7 through 21. 1 John 4, 7 through 21. Hear now the word of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. The word of God. Every human being either has or will meet God. It is certain and it is coming closer for each one of us who are alive now. How that meeting goes is crucial to your future unending existence. To many, meeting God will be a complete surprise. To others, they will have a short period of preparation to meet God that they may not even use. 
But to the Christian, we have a Christian lifetime of preparing to meet God. The man or woman of the world does not care about meeting God. The most important thing of all is just carelessly blown off. All to their eternal horror. The other day I was driving to work and as I was driving to work I had the thought about the class that we were going to do called how to read the Bible. Isn't it wonderful sometimes that you think thoughts in advance of them actually happening? You know, it's a God thing, right? I thought to myself that there are people in the Tri-City community, when I mean Tri-City, I mean Lemonster Fitchburg Gardner, that would not plunk down 125 bucks to learn over 12 weeks how to read the Bible, which is the most important book about the most important thing of your life. It's essentially like saying your soul isn't worth 125 bucks. When I got to work, I opened my email, and there I learned that Monty Tech had to clan cancel the class due to low enrollment. Now think about this. The Tri-City community was invited, and we couldn't muster 20 to 30 people to come. Now I want you to think about this. In those three cities, plus the hinterlands, there's got to be about 120,000 people. Now, 25 people out of 120,000 is two thousandths of 1%. Out of 120,000 people, we couldn't muster two thousandths of 1%. I came home and told my granddaughter how blessed she was that her eyes see and that her heart is opened to the Lord. Amen? We need to realize how blessed that is. The man of the world has this eyes closed tight. He doesn't want to see. We come together every Sunday to celebrate and we anticipate that celebration. We learn about it in greater depth and enjoy it ever more deeply. We learn that God is love. And we learn that the love of God is made visible and known to us. And we recognize that we are incapable of true love until we understand the love of God. Now listen to this. And this is the most important thing to draw from this, I think. We come to understand that God wants us all to lovingly look forward to meeting him without fear of punishment, but with a holy longing that motivates us now even in the smallest of things. Right? Think about that, that you can look forward 
to meeting God. If I were to ask each person here and each person on the live stream whether they are ready to meet God right now, we might have a very interesting morning. Folks might say, oh, pastor, I'm not living right. There's a few things you don't know that I do or don't do that I'm not happy about. But I'm not ready to meet God right now. To you, I would appeal to the Scripture. Point you away from gazing at your belly button and point you to the Scripture. A great prophet of old became so discouraged because the king died. Who's going to run the nation? The king's dead. Who's going to make sure that chaos is kept out and that peace is maintained? Listen to the sixth chapter of the great book of Isaiah. Ready? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting high upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Meaning, he was so glorious, it permeated this massive building he was in. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. What did Isaiah say? Can I put it in the vernacular for you? Give me that permission. He said this, I'm screwed. He said, woe to me, which is what that means. I'm not ready to meet God. For I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I speak profanely. I swear. I use vulgarity. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My whole family is a bunch of vulgar sinners. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. He says, this day, I'm not ready to meet God. I have a bad, dirty mouth. Get this. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Burning coal. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isn't it wonderful that when you're looking at your belly button and see the fact, note the fact, that you are an abject sinner, that your justification remains and your purification is there because of God, not because of you. In fact, in spite of you. Ain't that good news? 
And get this. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? So there's Isaiah noting that he has been purified by the extrinsic alien righteousness of God. And he said, here I am, send me. With all the boldness and confidence and love, he's ready to go preach the word for God because he's been cleansed. And he listen to the ministry he gets. Right? We think to ourselves, I was this week going, oh, we're in the midst of this place. Nobody wants the Lord God. I've got even, I had a guy yesterday on sermon audio saying bad things about God as a comment to my sermon. I'm like, what's going on here? And it's kind of like, you know what, man? You speak for me and you remain faithful even though, A, nobody wants to hear it or people are contrary to it, right? Isn't that our call and our charge? We are here to make his name famous no matter what even if we're alone in doing it, even if we're alone wherever we are. This is the ministry that Isaiah got. God said to him, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. He said, you're going to go preach, but no one's going to listen to you. No one's going to understand. No one's going to want God. But he said, go do it. And Isaiah said, how long, O Lord? How long do I have this unfruitful ministry? Most people today would say, I ain't doing that. I quit. But he said, how long? And God said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land and though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. What he's saying is the great majority of people will not listen to you and the people that do will be like a few stumps. Just a remnant. That's the age in which we're living. Now, when we read John like we just did, and we read John Gospel, we come up with three God is statements. In the Gospel of John, he says God is spirit. He doesn't say God is a spirit. He said God is spirit. And so we worship him in spirit and in truth, right? God is spirit. And then in the beginning of 1 John, he said God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. One of my favorite, favorite scriptures. God is spirit. God is light. And now he says, God is love. Isn't it beautiful? You see with the presentation here of truth, God is love. God is love. Now, Listen to what he's not saying. We might say, Grandma is a very loving person. But what is said here is different. John is not saying that love is the quality that God possesses. Rather, he is saying that the essence of God's divine being is love. 
the eternal love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that existed before the creation of the world spills over into creation as God perpetually gives of himself for the benefit of his creation. What makes the statement, God is love, so remarkable, perhaps is this, that of all the world's religions, their God is not love. Their God is not even loving. Their God is arbitrary and capricious. If you think the dominant ruling attribute of their God is not so nice, even the Native Americans knew that. As they went up to Mount Washington and they were afraid to go to the top because the weather was bananas, right? One day it's below zero, and the next day the winds are 200 miles an hour. You know, on the top of Mount Washington, they called it a gugachuk, that the, the great spirit was on top of that mountain, and he was dangerous and arbitrary and capricious. And if you went up there to meet him, you could die. Of course, they didn't know the true God. They didn't know that God is love. Love is not like other subjects. You just can't say, let's, let's talk about love, learn about it, and then do it. No, it really can only be understood by doing it. Somebody said it's more like measles than math. John affirms that the essence and evidence of Christian living is love. If you're becoming a more loving person, that is evidence that you are living in God. If you are not, that is evidence that you are not. We're commanded to love one another, aren't we? And John gives two reasons. One, because God is the source of loving others. Just as light radiates from the sun, love radiates from God's very nature. Now, love is not some fuzzy, syrupy, sentimental thing. You know what I mean? It's more than just a description of how you feel. I love pancakes. I love maple syrup. I had them on Saturday. And I was like, oh man, this is, what's better than being in New England and having maple syrup on hot pancakes? I love them. That's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> now, think about this. He says that we didn't love God first because we're unlovable. Right? There's nothing lovely about us, honestly. There's nothing within us that would cause a perfect and holy God to love us because we're unlovable. We turned our noses at God we said, forget you, Lord, we're going to do whatever we want. We didn't want God. I don't know about you, but before I was saved, I was running in the opposite direction, doing whatever I wanted, and it was sinful, and it was in complete disregard for the fact that there is a God. I didn't know who he was. I didn't care who he was. I was unlovable. And it says that he loved me first. You see, he loves us not because of us, but because of him. And so 
you'll never be less loved than you are right now, nor will you be more loved than you are loved right now. You're going to have a greater experience of that love when you get to heaven. But even though when you sin and you make those mistakes, he doesn't say, oh, by the way, you're not my daughter anymore. You're not my son anymore. I don't love you anymore. Just like your parent wouldn't do that, right? If you broke dad's lamp, dad wouldn't say, son, you're not my son anymore until you fix that lamp or replace it. I did that once. I broke my dad's lamp. It was a nice lamp. And I was doing a, I was drop kicking a, a what do you call it? A dishwasher. Uh, what do they call those things? What do you wipe the dishes with? Dish towel. I was drop kicking a dish towel. I thought I was uh, on the Patriots. I was just about, you know, 12 or something. Hit the lamp. My father was so upset. He wanted to kill me, but I knew he was still my dad and he still loved me, even though he wanted to kill me. Drop kicked it. My brother thought it was great. Uh, <laughs> God loves because it is his nature to love. And we are exhorted to love fact, the greatest commandment is that we love God and love people. Did you know that? So what's the greatest sin? Not loving God and not loving people. It's that simple, isn't it? This love that we're supposed to have for people is called agape. It's a word in Greek and it means unconditional love. We're supposed to love one another unconditionally. Now, I might not like you. You might be a porcupine. You might be hard to like. You may have a lousy personality. I might not agree with you on stuff, right? And vice versa. But that doesn't matter. I'm supposed to love you unconditionally and you're supposed to love me unconditionally and you're supposed to love each other unconditionally. And you say, Pastor David, how can we do that? And I say, God does that, did that, is doing that, and because this love that we love others with comes from him, we can do it. And by the way, guess who I've been loving all along, even though he's sometimes stupid, asinine, foolish? Yeah, you got it, me. I always seem to cut myself slack. You can cut your brother and sister slack, right? You see how that works? Oh yeah, I love me. Well, love them too. And by the measure of love that you have for one another, including those who are outside the walls of a church, will be magnetic and attractive. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. They really can't hear you. I can't hear you. Your lack of love is in the way. You can't gain people by not loving them. Now, get this. Let's get a little complicated for a moment. God is love. That does not mean that love is God. If you read, the, you know, listen to the music of all of the world, what sells? Love, right? It's a love song. Well, of course it's a love song. That's all they play is love songs. Even if they're crazy headbanger songs, they're love songs somewhere. It, love is not God. God is love. Love is not God. All love is not God-like love. In logic, A is B does not mean the same as A equals B or B equals A. God is love, but love is not God. Love doesn't define God. 
And people do that all the time. God defines love. God cannot fall in love. He is love. God cannot fall in love for the same reason water can't get wet. It is wet. God is love in eternal action. Now, get this out of your vocabulary, all right? Don't ever come to a marital counseling session with anybody and tell me this. I don't love him anymore. Or, I'm not in love with him. Or, I'm not in love with her. What does that mean? I'm not in love with her? What does in love with her mean? What does it mean? Think about what that means. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that you stopped the desire to keep loving that person. Hey, your love was conditional. Your love is not real, true love. It's fake. You're just loving that person as long as they're keeping you happy. Making your pancakes and your maple syrup. As soon as that goes, you're done. I don't love you really. I love me. And I'm only here to see you serve me. It's all about me, by the way. Not me unconditionally, sacrificially loving you. You see the diff? Oh. The fact that God is love, all his activity is loving. Even his judgment is loving. If he creates, he creates in love. If he rules, he rules in love. If he judges, he judges in love. All that he does is the expression of his nature, which is to love. And so God chose to love us unlovable people And number two, that love has been made visible and known at the cross of Jesus Christ. That there we were, thumbing our nose at God. And God sent his only son to rescue us from our own insanity. Our spiritual, ignorant insanity. He sent his son. He didn't send a prophet. He sent his only son. Only God can do it, and only man should do it. And only the could and the should come together in Jesus Christ. Because he's the God man, amen? Amen. And so he came that we might live through him. That this thing, this ship that we're all on together, right? Let's make believe that we're on a cruise, cruise ship. This is a cruise ship. The love boat. We're on this love boat and we're all cruising to heaven together. Remember, imagine if we never got out, we're just sitting here and I'm talking to you for like the next 300 years or whatever. Anyway, um, if you think about it, I lost my train of thought. It will come back to me. The love boat. Yeah. Um, How did God demonstrate his love? It says he became the propitiation for our sins. There are people walking around in the church and in the world that say God loves people, but he hates the sin. I'm here to tell you that he hates the sinner too. His wrath is about to be outpoured on sinners. Did you know that? That's why there needs to be a propitiation. That there needs to be some appeasement for the wrath of God 
on the sinner. On the sinner! We like to think, though, we can separate it. No, you can't. No, the person who sins, that soul will die. And that judgment is impending on that person. Like, as Edwards put it, a spider on a spider web going over a candle. That spider slips off that little web, he'll fall right into that burning candle. And so, he's the propitiation. Meaning, in Jesus, his wrath is completely appeased and satisfied. That's love. That is love. Why do you need a propitiation? Why can't God just wave a magic wand and forgive us of our sins? Why? The same way uh, that the state doesn't wave a magic wand and forgive people like serial murderers of 36 murders. If we, that happened, if the judge said, you know what, you killed 36 people, you're a nice guy, and your hair's really nice, and you know what, eh, you're forgiven, get out of here. The paper, the people would go crazy, why? Because justice would not have been done. Same way with God. God's justice requires the payment of penalty for sin. God can't just wave a magic wand without doing violence to his justice. And so he had to take your judgment on the cross. He was judged for you. His judgment was not for himself. His judgment was for you. And that judgment was meted out on the cross. Think about how horrible that judgment was that Jesus took. Well, that's the judgment that you and I deserved. That we're not going to get. Because he already took it. And when you realize that, that your judgment has already been executed, then you have confidence to meet God. It's a matter of reward, not zip code. You'll get there in Christ. Whatever reward you get, I don't know. You may not have much. You might be a street sweeper in heaven, for all I know. What are you doing for the Lord? He said invest, invest into eternity, right? What are you doing for him? But remember, he keeps great records. Even the smallest thing that you do for him, that nobody sees, he's keeping those records. Your reward will come. Propitiation. That's his love for us. You can't love as you should until you understand God has loved you. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's a should. It's a commandment. You're to love one another because he loved you. Not, well, maybe. It's optional. <laughs> I don't love porcupines and cactuses. No, no, no. Embrace that cactus. Embrace that porcupine. You're going to get hurt. It's okay. It's all right. Isn't it funny that the false gospel says, we want you to be healthy and wealthy. It's all about you and getting money and all kinds of things and all this other stuff. 
But it's never really about you loving other people. You know? Like, if you get a big car, that's a good thing. The love of God is the answer to a good life. Why are people so depressed today and so anxious today? Why? Because they're not living right. If they're loving others unconditionally and sacrificially, it would be a whole different game for them. That anxiety would go away. That depression would go away. But you don't get that usually. When you go talk to the counselor, they just go back in time and blame it on your mother and father. Let's see, who can we blame for your depression? Must be your mother. Must be your father. You know? God wants you to lovingly look forward to meeting him without fear of punishment because your judgment has already been taken on the cross and because you love like him. Not perfectly, but you desire to and you do love like him. And so you have no fear of punishment. Now, do you ever get into a situation where you're afraid? I think we all have, right? When you're afraid of talking to someone or you're afraid of talking in front of people or you're afraid of going somewhere and, you know, it's these people that you don't know. How do you overcome that? Well, some people say that the way to overcome your fear of public speaking is imagining that everybody doesn't have any clothes on. I'm sorry, but I can't do that. I think it's not Christian and it's sinful and I just can't do it. But if I love you, and that I can do, if I love you, I don't have any fear of talking to you. I don't have any fear of that situation because I love you, you know? And we love God because he loved us and we love him so much and we love others so much that we have no fear of meeting him because we know, despite our continuing imperfection, we'll be standing in him, in Christ. I.e., the tongue from the altar has touched our lips. You see? And it's his righteousness that we're relying on. And it's perfect. It'll never fail you. And so we look forward to meeting him without fear of punishment. Beloved, the world does not have that. They fear the unknown. They don't even know necessarily that they're going to meet God. But they're so anxious and they're so depressed because of all the health problems that they're starting to get as they turn like 30 years old. Did you know that? If you want to get life insurance in here, make sure you do it before you're 30. Because by the time you're 30, you're going to come up with something. They're going to say, oh, I can't insure you. You have corns on your feet. Right? By the time you're 60, forget it, right? How many other people does it have? I, you know, 10 health problems. I'm on 14 pills a day. You know what I mean? And the unbeliever looks at that and is afraid. And every health problem scares the daylights out of them and sends them to the doctors because they're really, truly, uly afraid of dying. They're afraid of meeting God. But you don't have to be that way. That's the gift that you have. Amen? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. Love for God and for others frees us from fear.
Now, let me ask you a question as we close. Which is easier, to love God or to love people? If we put that to a vote, the majority would say that it's easier to love God and harder to love people. Reason is simple. God is perfect and he loves me. People are imperfect and don't always love me. On top of that, some people just have lousy personalities. You would think that John would agree with you, but he doesn't. He says it's harder to love God than love people. People are visible. God is not. If you do not love people whom you see, how can you claim to love God whom you've never seen? Furthermore, if you don't love people, then you're not loving God because God has declared that one of the ways you show your love for him is to love people. He even says in verse 20, listen how hard-hitting it is, I love God and hates his brother. He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. You don't love your brother, you don't love God. You're a liar. You're fooling yourself. Not only should we love other believers, but we should also love our enemies. How do we love our enemies? Well, think about this. There was a church with a sign, and it said, Jesus only. The wind came and took away the first three letters. So the sign ended up saying, us only. We don't want to be an us only church, do we? Us four and no more. <laughs> the frozen chosen. <laughs> Christians and churches, love goes beyond the in-group. Includes the outsiders, doesn't it? How do we love wicked people? We love them with pity and prayer. We love them with pity and prayer. We sang the old hymn from time to time called The Love of God. I learned recently, and you may be surprised to learn, that two of the verses in the hymn were found written on the walls of an insane asylum. And those two verses were then incorporated into the hymn that we sing. Those two verses were scribbled on the wall, evidently by the bed of a man who found the love of God before he died from insanity and who knows what. Listen to these verses. This is it. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, it is 
incomprehensible nearly, totally, to know how much that you love us. Oh Lord, help us to love others with the love that you've given us and love you as well. Let us love sacrificially and unconditionally and let us live love continually. Father, help us, Lord, to be the signposts to a lost and hurting world that they could say, see how much they love. And this we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen and amen.